All right, so we're going to be looking at walking with Jesus through the Gospels in Luke chapter 5. Interrogations by the Pharisees, the religious leaders that he'll be receiving, and some conflicts that he experiences over the Sabbath. So coming into Luke chapter 5. I want us to pick it up in verse 27 and go to 32. The parallels in this will be Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13, and Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. And we are... With Craig, please, if we can start there. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. He said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a, there, there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not called to come to righteous, called I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now if you recall from last week, we saw that Jesus he healed the paralyzed man. And when he did that, something he spoke to him indicating that he was God. What did he say before he healed the man? Your sins, are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And of course, that's something that only God can declare. And so Jesus, in speaking that, the scribes and the Pharisees, they began reasoning to themselves, who can forgive sins but God? This man is speaking blasphemies. Now, they didn't speak this out. They thought it to themselves. They began considering, you know, how can he do this? And Jesus speaks to them, addressing their thoughts, because he knew their thoughts. Then we're seeing now he's, he's going to select Matthew as one of his disciples to come and follow him. At this point, there's going to be some interrogation by the Pharisees, because they're going to now, rather than just think these things, they're going to object to him as to what he's saying and the choice choices that he's making. To understand what's taking place here, I want to draw your attention to the map that's on the screen. Now in this on this map, you have the layout of some colors that are there. You've got pink that uh, that is would be um, hair before I speak to that and tell you what those colors are, when Jesus was born, do you remember who the king was, what his name was? Herod the Great. Now, Herod, when he died, he left his kingdom to three of his sons, Archelaus, Antipas, and Philip. So these colors that you see here are referencing those, uh, th those boundaries, those parcels of land territory that these particular sons looked after. Now, you, we, our interest is going to be with the green and with the yellow. The, the pink that is there Let's have a reference to Matthew chapter 2, and you'll get an idea of who's looking after the pink before we come into the green and the yellow. So Matthew chapter 2, and verse 2. Carolyn, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I said two. Verse 22. My mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> <clears throat> mm. 
But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. So this is speaking about Joseph. They've been in Egypt because Herod wanted to kill Jesus, wanted to kill the babies that were under two years of age in Bethlehem. So they, uh, Joseph was warned to go to flee Israel and go to Egypt. Uh, part of the reason for that was so that it would fulfill prophecy because Matthew tells us, out of Egypt I have called my son. But in the re they're coming back, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph and says, you can return back. He hears that Arch Archelaus was reigning in his father's stead, and that was enough for him to be concerned because Archelaus was pretty much well, similar to his father. So he decided to go to Nazareth. He went north. So the pink that you see there is the region of Archelaus. Okay. Now the green that you have, that is the region of Herod Antipas. And the yellow is the region of Herod Philip. All right. So this will give you a much better picture of that. Well, Philip sent his wife to Archelaus. Yes. Uh, more that Archelaus stole uh, his wife. It wasn't so much that Philip said, yeah, I'm not really keen on you anymore. You go and, yeah, uh, Archelaus, he, was, he went and, and uh, stole Philip's wife. And Archelaus is the guy who uh, will put John the Baptist to death. And he's also the one uh, to whom Jesus will be sent during his time in front of Pilate. And Pilate discovers that Herod is in Jerusalem. And so at that, he sends him to the uh, Herodian palace in Jerusalem for Herod to deal with him, hoping that he's going to be uh, uh, left not having to deal with him. But of course, he gets sent back because Herod, just when he finds out that he's a Galilean, he says, I'm not touching this then. All right, so we've got Herod, uh, Archelaus, down in Judea. We're not dealing with him right now. We're dealing with Herod Antipas and Herod Philip. Now, do you notice where their boundary lines are? What is, uh, see if I can get this, here we go. All right, so the boundary line here is just above what? What body of water? The Sea of Galilee is where their, um, their boundary lines meet. Matthew's a tax collector. Now, what kind of a tax collector is he? Romans, we, yes. So he's a Roman tax collector. Um, there's something else spoken about him regarding his position. More than just a tax collector, where is he? At a booth, or depends on the translation, sitting at the tax booth or the tax house. Any other translations? It's office, customs office. Now, this, this is going to help put things into perspective some for us if we can. Let's bring this back here. Bear with me while I. I'm dealing with a, a number of, of different things. A remote, a mouse for that one, a mouse for this one. Another arm. Another arm, yes. <laughs> or an assistant. Okay, so as you consider that map that is before you, do you remember a road that we spoke about that was very prominent? This was several uh, studies back. But we spoke about a very prominent road that ran through um, this region. Do you remember where it ran and what it was called? Pardon me? Sir? The Way of the Sea. The Way of the Sea. The Via Maris. All right? The Via Maris. So for your interest, it ran just along 
I've got two of these that I've got to do at the same time. I'm going to do on screen just for a second. It ran along the C and then it came up along here, along the, um, the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, and then it came up here and then made its way on to Damascus. Let me do it for you guys. The way of the sea came down from Egypt, along the sea, came through the Jezreel Valley. Uh, come over here a little bit more. Sea of Galilee came around the northern part of it, and then it went up. On to Damascus. And Just do it for that, that computer. We can see that computer. Pardon me? We can see that computer. You can just do it on that computer. Oh, this this does this one as well. Oh, they do both? Yes. But I'm doing this one for online, so. Oh, yeah, so. For our class, it's there. Now, to help you just a little bit, Matthew, let, let's back up. Rome, they. Uh, extracted taxes from their uh, the people that they had subdued. And something that would have gone on then would have been that the Herods would have said, or excuse me, the Romans would have said in this instance to the Herods, Archelaus, uh, Antipas, Philip, uh, now I'll, I want a million dollars from you. So perhaps, perhaps from uh, Antipas, I need a, a million dollars from you this coming year. Uh, Philip, I need uh, 750000 from you, and so on and so forth, all right? Now, then the, the various districts then would be put out to tender and basically tax franchise, franchises would rise up and say, all right, I'll put a bid in so that I can control or contribute from this particular district. And say for the area of, of Capernaum, that they would have been, let's say, $100,000 was the bid, and the bid was awarded then to that district of Capernaum, the northern part of, of the Galilee. Then the one that received that bid, that, that district, they would have a customs office, a booth, and from time to time, they with Roman soldiers would go to, to the houses and say, all right, time to pay up, time for your taxes. And they would, the Roman soldiers would go in, have a look at their resources and say, okay, and then they would just take, they would extract. It was extortion is what it was. So uh, in this case, Matthew had secured the bid for the northern region of the Galilee, Capernaum, and he was basically considered a turncoat, a traitor by his fellow countrymen, by the Jews, because uh, Levi, Levi is his name. Matthew is also his name. Uh, he is a Jew. And as such, doing this for the Romans, he would have been considered a traitor to his people. Why would he be doing something like this? Well, he looked at, at it as a, an, opportuni uh, an opportunity to make money. And it wasn't so much that the pay was great, but that the opportunity was great for him to make a good deal of money. Because whatever he made over and above the X amount that he secured the bid for, put in his pocket. It was his own. To give you an idea of, of sort of a picture of what's going on, this isn't just a matter of your taxes and, and you pay X amount of percentage of your income tax. This would have been extortion over and above your the income tax and they would have been going uh, house to house on occasion and uh, and extorting this this money and put it lining his pockets now you notice that he threw a party for a bunch of his friends levi did uh, there was a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him so he he throws a feast in his own home it gives an indication that he's a man of means and he became a man of means by what by what means <laughs> by extortion and so the people that are around are looking at him like I can't believe that you would do this to your own people. It's like stabbing them in the back. It's bad enough if it was for the Jewish nation, but the Jewish law forbade it. As a matter of fact, that uh, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, would not permit a publican, a tax collector, to even serve as a witness in a court of law. 
or because they didn't consider him to be, to be trustworthy. And this was one of the reasons they considered him to be a traitor. So if he's a traitor, how can he be trusted with, uh, with matters that are of such importance of somebody's well-being? All right, so this is who Jesus comes to. This is, this is who he, he finds him at this tax booth. And he says to him, follow me. What does Matthew or Levi do? He's called Levi here. He's referred to as Matthew in Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 9. So another name. Matthew Metatiahu means gift of Yahweh. Matai is a shortened form of it. The gift of Yahweh. So what is Levi? Levi is a, pardon me? He's a Jew. Yes, he's a, he's a Jew. What does, where does the name Levi harken back to? Joseph's, Joseph's son. Joseph's son, yeah. Levi. Levi is his name. Pardon? Yeah, Joseph's son, sorry. Ja oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I just heard sons and I just automatically went with it. Yes. Jacob's sons, one of his 12 sons. So one of the 12 tribes of Israel is the tribe of? Levi. Levi in English and in Hebrew would be Levi. Uh, so he was known as, as Levi, and that was his Hebrew name. Uh, scholars believe that, that Matthew was likely his name after his conversion, after he became a disciple of Christ. So Jesus basically came to Matthew. We don't have that specifically per se, like we have uh, that you're no longer named as Simon. It's not, I give you the name Peter, but his name has changed. Just like Saul, he changed his name to Paul, but we don't have any record that Jesus changed his name per se. So here he abandons everything right away, not unlike we have earlier in this same chapter when the other four fishermen, when Jesus said, follow me, what did they do? Left everything, left their nets. Now, he would have had to have left everything that he had with somebody that he could entrust it to um, because this money belonged to Rome. And if he didn't get that money in proper hands, what does that mean for him? <laughs> now, what means what? <laughs> Kinda. We think off with your head, but in that day it would have been... Yeah. <laughs> right? So, he would have been crucified because uh, he would have been considered a traitor against Rome, which was Rome had the power to, to come against and uh, easily put down anything like that uh, and make a great example of them to other people to try to dissuade people from doing something similar. So in this instance, he becomes a follower of Jesus right away. He, he leaves everything. Now, he's, he's in this area of Capernaum. So why do you think he left what he had, this lucrative business to follow Jesus. Yeah. How do we, why, why can we say that? Probably heard about it. So he spent a lot of time doing stuff there. What else? What other big thing that we can see that we, we can get a good idea that Matthew or Levi, Levi, had heard about him? We'd seen it last week. The what about them? What about the healing? Well, he would have seen that. Okay. What could have been there? We we're, we can't be sure that he saw them per se. Um, it's possible that he was part of the crowd at some time that saw it, but at the very least, he at least heard about it. Because we hear that his the fame of Jesus went through all the area, including where? Syria, Decapolis, um, the other side of, of the Jordan, and um, well, there's one other place. Oh, Decap did I say Decapolis? I said Decapolis. Um, anyway, throughout the region. And, and his fame was great. So at the very least, Levi had heard about Jesus. 
So when he hears, when Jesus comes and he meets him face to face and he says, follow me, this man is compelled to follow Jesus. So he abandons everything. And there is an indication here that it's, a, it's an all in. He throws a feast for Jesus and who shows up at the feast? <laughs> yeah. So uh, other tax collectors and uh, besides them, uh, others who sat down with them. So other franchise, franchi, uh, fr franchisees, if you will, other districts, maybe some that worked for him uh, as underlings, uh, employees, because this would have been a big job. He would have been like a foreman, if you will. And uh, so a great number of tax collectors came. For the Pharisees, this is a big problem because they are the low of the low. They are, when, when we see the tax collectors coming to get, re, rebutting Jesus, rebuking him, it's because often because Jesus is seen hanging around with, what did I say? Excuse me. <laughs> the Pharisees coming against Jesus because he's hanging around with tax collectors and sinners. It's interesting. Over and over again, it's not just he's hanging around with sinners, but he's hanging around with tax collectors and sinners. Like, like they, they, were, they were in a category all their own. Really, they were. But you got to keep in mind, this isn't like the tax man of today at all. All right? Uh, this isn't Revenue Canada that we're talking about. This is, they are extortion. Okay? So, this is that situation. I want you to keep that in mind. I, I, want, I want to put like a, like a big red asterisk right beside that idea that uh, Levi or Matthew is now becoming one of Jesus' disciples as a tax collector, as this man who has gotten rich on the backs of his fellow Jews. So keep that in mind for another for about a week or two down the road when we look at another disciple that becomes part of this crew, when we look at the apostles, when the, when the 12 are selected, uh, as to what kind of relationship that's going to be taking place there with, a, with, at the very least, one other of those apostles that get selected. And uh, it'll, it'll, pardon me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we'll, yes. <laughs> the, the, so the zealot, but literally in English, it's what? The zealot. The zealot. Yeah. The zealot. Okay? So, uh, yeah, we'll be looking at that. And what, what does that have to do with anything? Uh, how is that something of like, like going to be like this with Matthew? And it'll, it'll open up some ideas when, so we've telegraphed that. For, and we're going to telegraph also this idea that there were times when the, a dispute would break out amongst the disciples as to who was the greatest. So it was more than just this idea of you put 12 guys together, that's what's going to happen. You know, you're just going to, you're going to have these, these were men that, uh, because of their backgrounds, it contributed, it contributed to that sort of an idea. So, go ahead. Well, I was just looking at this, um, Levi made a great feast in his house, a large company of tax collectors and others. The Pharisees and scrubs grumbled at his disciples, uh -huh. saying, why do you eat me? And, I, and, and it makes you wonder, you know, how did the disciples actually feel about this? <laughs> these guys were businessmen. They were fishermen. Yeah. And I'd say they would have had their run-ins with mm -hmm. Matthew and the like. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So absolutely, it's a good point, a good observation, that they would have been on the receiving end, the brunt of those Roman swords bringing, coming into the, breaking into their their uh, fishing shack, if you will, or their houses to extort money for Matthew, for Levi. And so now this guy's a follower of Jesus, and they're going to be like, what's this guy doing here? What is Jesus up to? And now they're hanging, uh, they're at this feast, and they're going to be uncomfortable because not only is Matthew there, but a bunch of his tax collector buddies are there. 
And they're like, this, this is not right. There's something wrong with this. And so the Pharisees indeed. So in verse, um, verse 30, the scribes and the Pharisees, they complained against his disciples, not against Jesus, did they? Why did they do that? Why did they complain against the disciples and not against Jesus? I think they're still in the feeling out stage. Okay, feeling out stage? The, the Pharisees, you mean? Okay. Any other ideas why they're speaking to the disciples and not to Jesus? Okay. Maybe there's even back then a, a, a proper avenue okay. to approach a teacher. Yeah. So I don't know if that's, if that's, if that's, if that's the case. I have not done any study on it. Mm -hmm. That could possibly be. Okay. And there could be one other aspect as well, is that they see these disciples as soft targets and Jesus as a hard target. Because Jesus, he's got the support of the masses, right? Mm -hmm. And they know that he is one who teaches as one who has authority. Not as the scribes teach. So they could be intimidated by Jesus. But the disciples, I mean, these are newbies following along. And if they can dissuade the disciples from following this rabbi, then what's a rabbi without followers? without teacher, without disciples. So if they can shame these men, the disciples, then perhaps they can get to the rabbi that way, or at the very least, dissuade them, shame them from, from uh, being followers of this rabbi and try to cut the feet from underneath this movement. So there could be elements of that. We, don't, we can't be certain why that is the case. But this is the interrogation that begins. They begin to object. This isn't right. As far as they're concerned, it's not right. Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And in so posing the question and their objection, notice the disciples, they don't respond. But Jesus does. So Jesus takes the question knowing that it is intended for him. Knows that, that it's about his motives and the things that he's doing, his teachings that he is bringing, his actions. So Jesus responds, and what does he say? Okay, so let's let's stop at that first part. Who needs a doctor? Okay, be less let less specific than that. Who needs a doctor? Sick people. Sick people. Sick people need a doctor. So Jesus is saying, I didn't come to those who are already well. The well don't need a doctor, but the sick do. So he rebukes them in this instance. And uh, he says, sick people need, need a doctor. Now, some would say, you know what, when, the, when these tax collectors and sinners came to Jesus, uh, they, some look at that and say, well, Jesus, he's just all accepting and all loving. And these, they were good. And you, just, you can just hang around with Jesus and everything's going to be okay. We're going to look at how Jesus responds to that by his own words. But the first rebuke is when, when they say, you know, you, you shouldn't be hanging around with these people because they are the low of the low, they're the scum of the earth. I mean, if there are unrighteous, these are they, and we don't want to be contaminated by them. So Jesus is rebuking them that they have rejected and neglected to help those who are in greatest need among them. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13. Now, in verse 13, Matthew 9 and verse 13. And 
and we're at Johnny, are we? Please. Matthew 9 and 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I have, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Recall the sinners. Was that it? That's it for what it says in the uh, in our translation. Okay. Now have a look and make a comparison between Luke's record of this event, of that particular response, and what Matthew says. What is the difference between the two? I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and. Mark, in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, records similar to Luke. He doesn't add in what Matthew draws attention to. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, is what Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and the scribes as a second rebuke. But he doesn't just say that. What does he say just prior to that? What does he say just after that? Go and learn what this means. Now, it, pardon me? They had to go to Hosea, but they would know that. When Jesus says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, he, they would know it already. They would be like Hosea the prophet. But what is Jesus saying to them when he speaks that? Just think of that first part. Go and learn what this is. I think there has, there's an aspect of doing here. Doing, yeah. As a Pharisee, what do you, what would you expect of, of a Pharisee as far as religious matters are concerned? They are going to be the ones that if there's righteousness being pursued, you'd expect that the Pharisee is the one that's got it covered. Do you remember Paul? He spoke about his pedigree, if you will, or his resume. Uh, that if you think you've got something to boast about, I have more to boast about. And then he gets into it in the book of Philippians, his letter to the church in Philippi, and it's in chapter uh, chapter 3, is it? Hebrew of Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin. Is it 3? So he said, if you think I've, you've got something to boast in, I have more. Um, he says, I was circumcised the eighth day. All right, so most all Jewish men would have the same. I'm from, this, from the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, and concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. In other words, I had it all down. As far as zeal, I was persecuting the church concerning righteousness, which is in the law. I was... Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I was the sniper and I, I hit every target. I wasn't backing down. So you'd expect that if somebody knew the law, it was going to be the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus is saying it's not enough to know the law. I want you to put the word into practice. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. What was he rebuking them there? What was he telling them? They weren't practicing what they were preaching. So let's look at something else. He was saying, you're great at sacrifice. You're great at making sure that all, everything is in place, but you're missing something. You're missing mercy. Because mercy is hard to measure, isn't it? Sacrifice is easy. You take an animal, you bring it to the priests, you sacrifice it, it goes onto the altar, and it's tangible. Uh, tithing. It's a tangible thing. You, you count out your spices and your, your dill, your cumin, and so on, and Jesus even rebuked them for that because they just made sure to the very 
the, the very measure to the very grain or the very uh, amount. He says, you've, you've missed the weightier points of the law. And what were the weightier points? Mercy. What is it? Generosity. Generosity. Yeah. He said, you strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What does that mean? This is in Matthew's account. Any idea what that means? How many have heard that before, that passage? You strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What does that mean? Put more weight into the less weighty things in the scripture. Okay. And the weightier things, they brush it off. Okay, so there was certainly that aspect. What did it mean that you, if you were to look at it literally, so yes, you're right, Craig. Literally, what is Jesus saying about a gnat? You strain out a gnat. Why would somebody strain out a gnat? What is a gnat? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an insect, a small insect. And according to the law, it is, what is that? It's a no It's a no <laughs> According to the law, a gnat was unclean. According to the law, a camel was unclean. So he says, you, you strain out gnats to make sure they're not in your food so you don't accidentally eat a small little thing that's unclean. But you swallow a camel. And it goes to what Craig had mentioned, the weightier points of the law, you, you look at insignificant, not necessarily insignificant. You, you, you major on some things, but you minor on others. And you're guilty of weightier measures, points of the law. This is what Jesus is speaking to them here. Don't overlook mercy for the sake of your adherence that can be measured by people saying, you know, I'm, I'm keeping a good account of the, the tithes I'm giving, the sacrifices I'm offering, and so on. But Jesus says, you're, you're, you, are, you haven't learned what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And then he says, so this is Jesus' response, the last part of it. This is his response to those who say, well, Jesus just allowed anyone and everyone to come and hang out with them, and they were good, good to go. He, you know, Jesus was okay with sinners, okay with tax collectors, in a sense, but he didn't just hang out with them. What did he do? He taught them, more specifically in context of, of this particular verse. So coming back again to Luke, pardon me? Uh, in Healed their spirits. Well, in, when they did what? Repent. I didn't, uh, I came to call sinners what? Look at chap, uh, Luke chapter 5 and verse 32. Right. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Not just that I said, okay, sinners come, all good, open up, open the gates wide, everybody come in. No. Come by what means? Come by repentance. So the, the Pharisees, they were missing these things. And Jesus was rebuking them on that account. Now, that brings us into the next section. Luke chapter 5, verses 33 down to 39. And I think we're at Deb, are we? said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so did the disciples of the Pharisees, and yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment, the patch from the new one will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking the old wine, wants the new, for he says the old is better. What is Jesus doing here? 
They are, they then respond to him, hoping that they've got something else. All right, why do the disciples of John fast and uh, make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? So they weren't successful in this. And then it says, then they said, so it's like they're, all right, well, if that's the okay, case, let's, let's see if we can get this straightened out. We fast, John's disciples fast, but you and your disciples aren't fasting. Why not? What, what does that have to do with it? What, what does the fasting have to do with anything? Who did? How do we know that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Luke chapter 18. What does the Pharisee say? I fast twice a week. Luke chapter 18. <laughs> Luke 18 and verse 12. He says, I thank, I thank God that I'm not like this. What? Tax collector. What are these Pharisees doing here in Luke chapter 5? I'm glad I'm not like this or these because it was Matthew and all of his buddies. I'm glad I'm not like these tax collectors. What's the very next thing they say? Why don't you and your disciples fast? We fast twice a week. Why aren't you like us? And Jesus, in a sense, is saying, I've come to seek and to save the lost. Come to, so I've come to bring healing to, to those who are sick. I've come to bring mercy to those who are in need of mercy and to call sinners to repentance. Then they get on this idea of fasting. And Jesus is saying, listen, I have re I've come to do these things. I haven't come to fit into your mold. I'm not a cookie cutter Messiah. I've come according to the, what is this? Scriptures. Not according to your plans. What's that? What you think. And another aspect of it, another description of it. Not according to the what of the elders. Traditions of the elders or the traditions of your fathers. See, the Pharisees expected that the Messiah himself, when he came, he also would be a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? A Pharisee is one who's not fair, you see. <laughs> Sadducees are those who are sad, you see, yeah. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah. Over the, pre the, over the preceding 400 years, four to 500 years before Jesus, there had been this development of their traditions of the elders. What were they? They, they developed uh, traditions, rules, and regulations that became known as, ultimately it became known as the, good guess, Mishnah. The Talmud is another set, but it didn't come into full um, completion until about 200 AD. So it was in process probably right or just prior to, the, to Jesus' time, like say about 5 BC up until about 200 AD. But during Jesus' lifetime, the Talmud had not been completed. But the Mishnah is coming into, well, it hadn't been fully completed either, but the, the body of work as far as, as these traditions are concerned, became known as the Mishnah. There was more stuff added to it after the life of Christ, uh, at least his ministry on earth, in person, because his ministry still continues today, right? So, became known as the Mishnah. Let, let me uh, explain a little bit about the Mishnah. So I'm going to... Uh, 
consult my notes quite a bit here because it, I want to get it right, okay? So the rabbis from the time of the return from Babylon, the, the Babylonian exile, they started to build fence laws or rules around the commandments. How many commandments in the Old Testament? So how many? Ten. All right, we've got ten. Thirteen. Thirteen. All right, so yes and yes. There are ten commandments that are referred to as the moral law. But that is part of this 613 laws that God had given to Moses to give to the people. The civic laws, or the civil laws, the moral law, and the ceremonial law. 613. So, the, the rabbis, after the return to Israel, following Babylon, figured we need to be sure not to break any of these commands, and they wanted to, so, so they, uh, they started trying to fill in what they figured to be gaps in the fence. They wanted to build a big fence around the law, these commandments, so that they wouldn't potentially break one of these, one of the original. So, uh, I'm not going to get into all of the terminology here because I don't want to bog us down in terminology that you're not likely going to remember. So, a body of teaching. I'll use I'll use just just a couple of, of term, terms here. So, sofarim. S o p h e r i m. Sofarim. It, it used a, a form of, of logic that w was used by the rabbis that meant peppery or sharp. And uh, the underlying thought process could be summarized by the following question. This is what they would ask themselves. Given a specific statement or commandment, how many new regulations could be logically derived from that original statement or commandment? So they'd look at one commandment. And they would start thinking, okay, how many new regulations could be derived from that that we really should be observing that haven't been explicitly stated by that command? So, um, you shall uh, uh, keep the, the Sabbath day holy. So then they would look at that and say, okay, how many, how many more regulations could, lo how many things could logically be derived from that? What does that look like? How, does, how do we do that? And then they would put in place these other regulations to avoid or to make sure they were fully observing that commandment. So they were basically trying to put practicality, somewhat practicality, into the command. Like, okay, keep the Sabbath holy, what does keeping the Sabbath holy look like? In a sense, they say, well, more like. How might we break this, that commandment? How might we make it, keep it, or, or not observe it and keep it holy? And so, well, this might do that. So then, well, we've got to. An example would be don't walk more than a mile from your house. If you're walking two, you're going to do more work and you're going to get tired out and break things out because you're not you're working on the Sabbath. So they could only travel a Sabbath day's journey on the Sabbath. And they had several dozen more that apply just to the Sabbath, ultimately. And you would find it in the Mishnah. Okay? Good point. Don't have cheese because it comes from a goat and the meat would come from a land or a goat. So let me let me jump on that a little bit more. Uh, when we were in Israel, our morning meal was you could have all the dairy you wanted in the morning, but no meat. You could have fish, but not meat, because it wasn't considered there was no way meat and fish 
could be mistaken as goat. So you could have dairy, and the only meat you could have was fish. At nighttime, you could have all the meat you wanted, but no dairy. There was no dairy. No ice cream, no cream for your coffee. They would have substitutes for those things. So they, they had lactose so lactose intolerant people. Deb's like supper time, and look at all of these creamy desserts, and there's no lactose. There's no milk in it. Okay. <laughs> so how can we? This was the idea of this sofarim. How can we make sure? So the, the law was, uh, don't boil a kid, a baby goat, and its mother's milk. What was the deal with that? Well, the Canaanites would take its would take a, a baby goat away from its mother. Then they would milk the mother and boil the kid in its mother's milk as a sacrifice to Baal. So, <laughs> so it was like a first fruits offering to Baal. Pardon me? That particular command is repeated numerous times. Hmm. Oh, All right, okay. so so by the time the Israelites got back into ba back from Babylon, the Canaanites ceased to exist, and so the possibility of following this was pretty remote. However, it was still in the law, and so how can we make sure we never, never, ever, 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 accidentally, potentially, without even knowing it? seethe or boil a, a baby goat in its mother's milk. So Deb uh, mentioned a good part of it. Today, in Israel, it's, a, it's uh, not kosher. It's against rabbinic law for you to have dairy and meat at the same meal. That's why in the morning, it's all dairy, no meat. In the evening, meat and no dairy. So in your stomach at the same so there needs to be at least four hours by rabbinic law between eating dairy and meat. So there's no possibility for, if you ate milk for the possibly, or dairy product, for it to seethe in your acids, stomach acids. And then if you were to consume even a bite of meat, could be a goat, could be goat meat. And now you're, and it could be a baby goat. And now you're, and who knows where the milk came from. So, sofarim law. Now, uh, more than that, all Jews need to have two sets of dishes. One for dairy, one for meat. If, by accident, meat and dairy got put on the same plate, they have to do something with that dish. Either they destroy it, throw it out, or they will give it to... Gentile, <laughs> give it to <their> Goyim, <laughs> because it doesn't matter. Um, if you sneak in for a piece of cheese, man, the choice. <laughs> you, 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 you could get yourself a, a nice set of dishes. <laughs> well, let me let me just read something to you here. Um, so, this idea was suppose at noon you choose to eat uh, a dairy meal. You take a plate, and from this you eat some cheese. After you eat the cheese, you may wash and scrub the plate thoroughly, but there may be a tiny speck of cheese still left on the plate that you did not see in the evening. You choose to eat meat, and you place the meat on the same plate from which you had eaten the cheese earlier in the day. The meat might pick up the tiny speck of cheese, and no matter how remote it might be possible, that the cheese that you just ingested that was there from noon, but now was made from the milk of the mother of the baby goat you're eating later in the day. And as you swallow this tiny speck of cheese with the meat, you see the kid in the milk of the mother, and you violate Torah. So that's why all Jews must have two sets of dishes, one for dairy, one for meat. There was a a subsequent set of rules or laws that came up called the Tanium. And this is the only other, this is the last uh, uh,
T-A-N-N-A-I-M. Tanaim. And basically, it was a, a follow-up of the Sopharim, but it said this. Under this idea that um, one of these laws can disagree with another one of these laws, the Sopharim, the Sopher, but can't disagree with the Torah. When it came to the Tanaim, when they had further laws come under this, and I'm not getting into all the, the ideas of it, it was basically uh, a Tana may disagree with a Tana, but it cannot disagree with a Sopher. And as a result, ended up making a Sopher equivalent to Scripture. So the traditions of the elders that were developed here, once it, did, it progressed even more with this line of reasoning, now they've regarded Sopharim as Scripture. It became the Mishnah. The Tanim became the Talmud. And so the Talmud, after so long, became regarded in the same sense. And that would be long since Jesus' day. But Orthodox Jews observe both the Mishnah and the Talmud today. Traditions of the elders or traditions of the fathers. And that's why uh, Jesus speaks to the, to the Pharisees and says, you observe the traditions of the elders, but you fail to observe the law, the scripture. Exactly. Exactly. Now, this became known as the oral law. This was known as the written law. Why was it known as the written law? Because they had record written of it. But they believed when they started developing this, that they said, okay, well, uh, it Moses, when he received the law, he didn't write it all down, and he passed the rest of it on. He wrote down the 613 commandments, but he didn't pass on or didn't write down the, uh, the rest of them that they had here, the Sopharim and the, uh, the Tanim. And so uh, he passed it on orally to Joshua, then Joshua to the judges, and judges to the prophets, and prophets to the, to the scribes. And, had a, and so now we have it written down. And it was a work in progress, the Mishnah. It's funny they would uh, consider the judges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because everyone did what was right in their own eyes. <laughs> really, yeah. True enough. <laughs> but that's why they came to fast twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. John's disciples, they fast. Why don't you and your disciples fast? See, Jesus came and said, I'm not here to uphold the oral traditions. He wouldn't call it the oral law. They called it the oral law. They held it up with as equivalent to the Torah, the scripture. But it was not because it was an invention of their own devices. And so they had to legitimize these extra rules that they figured we had better put them in. But if God didn't put them there, why did they need to put them there? Uh, so this is the question that he, they bring to Jesus. And he said, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? A time of celebration, a time of joy. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be wet taken away. And uh, it's a terminology that usually refers to death. Time to come is coming when the bridegroom will die. And then they will fast in those days. Because it's a time of mourning. But then Jesus is going to rise from the dead again. Or not again, but he'll rise from the dead. He'll be alive again. And when he does, it'll be a time once again of Celebration. 
is there a fast that's commanded for us today? There's no commanded fast for the church to observe, but we may fast. But it's not commanded that we fast. But when we do fast, Jesus says, these are the things that you need to be aware of. Don't fast like the Pharisees do. Anyway, we won't get into that tonight. Then he speaks the parable about not putting a piece of um, unshrunk cloth or, or um, from a new garment onto an old one. Why? Because it'll tear the old garment. Anyone ever done that? I've seen the latest styles. Nobody patches clothes. <laughs> Nobody patches clothes. Free air conditioning. All right. <laughs> then he says, um, no one puts new wine in old wineskins because the new wine will end up bursting the old. Because when you have a skin, animal skin, what happens when you put the new wine in it before it ferments? And as it ferments, what happens to that, that skin? It stretches. And if you were to pour that out and put new wine in it and cap it, what's going to happen? It will once again stretch, but it only has a certain stretching capacity. And once it hits that capacity, if it's already stretched, it's going to burst and you'll lose that new wine. Jesus is saying, I've come to bring a newness, but I'm not about to fall into line with these things that you guys have in mind for me, me to try to, to fit into here. When he says in, um, in verse 39, no one having drunk uh, old wine immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. What does that mean? It could be one of two interpretations. One is that he's prophesying and saying, in the end, you're going to end up reject the new and stay with the old. In other words, what Jesus is bringing, they're going to, he's saying, you're going, to, you're going to end up rejecting this new wine and you're going to say, I like the old stuff, the Mishnah, the Sofarim. Sof Isn't it? But it had become such a part of them that it became their identity. So the Jewish people, they're very strong on tradition. 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 Anybody ever seen Fiddler on the Roof? Anybody ever hear of the Fiddler on the Roof? <laughs> it's a lengthy, lengthy movie. It's interesting in parts, but it is very lengthy. But you'll find in it, it, it captures the, uh, the, a picture of Jewish mindset, that everything they do is based on tradition. <laughs> <laughs> I made Deb watch it with me one time, and uh, it's a musical. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it comes back, the theme comes back over and over again, tradition, tradition. Um, and to consider life for a Jew without tradition would be as strange as seeing a fiddler on a roof because the fiddlers belong on the ground, fiddling where you would expect to see it. So tradition. The other interpretation, which um, could have been direct, would have been directed towards the theology is this. The old wine is the scripture, the mosaic Judaism. So what the scriptures state, that's the old wine. And the new wine is Pharisaic Judaism, this. And Jesus is saying the old wine, the scriptures, Moses law is better. Either way, the point is taken as valid from Jesus and against the Pharisees. There's an aspect here too, though, that when you're putting new wine in your wineskins, there's a waiting process for it to become good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, as far as it being, uh, you know, the, it, 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 the, old, the new wine 
what they're doing there, I guess it would be there. I guess that's why they would come up with that. Would be on terms of prescription. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, now, I had anticipated we might get into seeing the conflicts about the Sabbath, but it would appear as though we are not going to be able to tackle that tonight. Is that an awe? No. <laughs> Wouldn't the new, like, speaking of the new covenant compared to the old covenant? Mm -hmm. This old covenant was based on works, right? Yes. The new covenant is based on faith. Mm -hmm. You can't combine the two. They do not mix. So you can't put new covenant into old wineskins. That's right. And that's just another whole aspect of that. Exactly. And also, when he mentions the, the, the new garment and the old garment, there's there's an aspect of there has to be a change. Uh, um, I mean, this is all based off of uh, the call for repentance mm -hmm. in the verses earlier. So Jesus is basically saying, I'm not going with your traditions, guys. I've, I've come to bring a fulfillment of the old, the scriptures. I have come to fulfill the law but not in the way that you've expected it, because you want me to fulfill this law. But I reject that law. Because he didn't give it. That's man-made law. He said, I've come to fulfill this law so that you don't have to be bound by this any longer. You don't have to worry about whether or not your plate has dairy and meat on it or has had it on it sometimes throughout the day. Jesus deals with that idea as he goes his next journey, as we walk with him back to Jerusalem. So now he's going to Jerusalem. Now, we might think that it's going to be Luke chapter 6, but between Luke 5 um, and verse, what are we at there for verse 39, and Luke 6 verse 1, we have inserted, uh, not inserted, but we have as an experience, part of the journey is John chapter 5. So Jesus is heading now. Remember we went from John uh, 4 back to the Galilee. Now Jesus is returning to Jerusalem in John chapter 5. And he's going to encounter a man at the pool of Bethesda. Can I? Can I bring up the pool of Bethesda for you here? So that you here's the pool of Bethesda. Yes. Here, here's the pool of Bethesda right here. Do you see it there? Do you see the cursor? All right, you didn't expect that to be there. All right, here's the pool of Bethesda, and the pool of Bethesda from the opposite direction. Or from so we're going to look at it from from being standing. Where's my cursor? We're going to be standing over here, looking back this way. See these four towers? All right, we're going to be looking at it from the backwards direction. And there you go. So you see the four towers right here. Now we're looking at the pool of Bethesda. Is this particularly here? It's both of them, but particularly here. So, particularly the lower of the two pools would be the pool of Bethesda. The whole thing is it, but where you would have found this man would have been at the lower deck of that pool. It's still there. Is it still there? Right there. That's what you'll find in, in uh, Israel today, is those ruins, and those. And that one. That one. That one. That's it. 
let me just bring bring your attention back for a second to this, and then we'll end it here, and we'll pick it up next week. So there's the pool of Bethesda, uh, as it like as it was depicted in a model of what it likely looked at looked like in Jesus' day, according to the. Here it is. Look at uh, John chapter. Um, I said John five, and uh, I was going to say the verse, but um, yeah, it's it's verse. Look at verses one and two, and we will. What? Pardon me. It's not, but there's something on this map that's going to be pertinent. Okay, so John five one and two. Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there was there is a Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. Now there, yeah, now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called the Seda, and which was surrounded by five colored covered colonnades. All right, there we go. Uh, Sheep Gate, right here. Sheep Gate is this gate right here. This is present day walls, the white, and what you see in this section right here, which is the blank inside those walls, that's the Temple Mount right there. Sheep Gate is this, and right here is the Pool of Bethesda. Sheep Gate. White is the walls, uh, present day walls of Jerusalem, and here is the Pool of Bethesda. In this section is where the Temple Mount stood. So where would the Wailing Walls be? The Wailing Wall is... Um, up here. All right, so the Temple Mount is not depicted on here, but this would have been the, the, truck, the rectangle of the Temple Mount right here. So the Wailing Wall, which is more technically called the Western Wall, is this wall right along, would have been this wall right here. Pardon me? ABDE. Yeah, ABDE would have, would have formed that uh, retaining wall. So remember, these walls that you're looking at on this picture is just the walls of the city. So when we see people at the wall, they're actually facing east. Yes, they are. Yes. So we'll leave it at that. We'll pick that up next week to see what Jesus does and how he addresses what the Pharisees had brought up while he was in, uh, in Galilee, when he t brings Matthew as one of his followers in Capernaum, going back to Jerusalem, and he's going there to, and he will address that idea that he's not going to follow the um, teachings of the oral law. And there's a reason that he heals this man at this place at this time.